Welcome to our short discussion on statistical tables and graphs. The first type of display of data is just a simple frequency table. Uh, and the most basic type of frequency table just has two columns. The first column lists all the categories of the data, and then the second column simply lists how many you have of each of those, right? The frequencies of them. Then you could make that table a little bit more advanced and you could add in relative frequency. So instead of just telling me there are six of these, seven of these, 10 of these, and 12 of these, you could then also report how much that is of the total, right? So the frequency of that category divided by the total frequency. And then you list that as a percentage or as a, a decimal called, you know, a proportion. But, you know, if you list it as 0.1, or 10%, it, it means the same thing. Usually you list it as a percentage because you know you gotta think about your audience. You're gonna present this data to somebody else and they might not understand that 0.1 is 10%, but everybody understands what 10% is, right? And then if you wanted to go even further, the last column you could do would be the cumulative frequency. Uh, and then that is basically you're just adding up the category. So you, if the first category has 10%, and the second category has 5%, then that first category's cumulative frequency is just 10% because it's the first category. But then the second category adds in that 5, and so now you have a 15% cumulative. And it keeps going all the way until you get to the bottom, and of course the last category always has a cumulative frequency of 100 because it you know, is the last category, so it adds up all of the last bits to account for the entire data set. Okay, so when you're dealing with data and you want to do these frequencies, you oftentimes have to bin your data. And what binning means is you just have to put them in groups because you can't list out every option. Now, if you 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 know if you have data that's very simple and it doesn't have a large range of uh, answers, then you can do them individually. So, like if you asked people, um, "What's your favorite uh, day of the week?" Well, there's only seven answers, right? So you could have seven lines in your table very easily, and then you would have a frequency next to each day of the week for how many people chose, you know, Monday through Sunday. And then you could do the relative frequencies, blah, 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 blah. And that'd be easy because there's only seven choices. But if you asked questions where you had, you know, a hundred different options, well, you can't have a hundred lines. So you have to put them in bins. So with qualitative data, uh, you normally <clears throat> don't bin them unless you have a lot of stuff. But you normally with qualitative data, you don't have a lot of options. So there's uh, a small enough number of them that they can, each one can have their own uh, category. But you could bin them together if, if you had to. Quantitative data, right, which is where we have counts and measures, those almost always have to get binned because, again, you have too many options you know the only thing that you could have that could possibly not be binned would be asking them something simple like um how many days a week do you eat out you know and, th and then again your answers you know will be between zero and seven so then you could put those individually but if you were you know gathering data and one of them was age right or you know um salaries those would have too big of a range to have individuals, so you'd put them in bins. So a bin is just a group where you would group things together. So like for age, you could do age range, you know, like maybe below 18 and then 18 to 25 and then 26 to 40 or whatever. You know, those would be, those would be your bins. Okay, so let's see if we can classify each of the following types of data as either qualitative or quantitative. How about brand names of shoes in a consumer survey? And you can see that those are definitely qualitative because they're just names, heights of students, right? Quantitative. And more specifically, would it be continuous or discrete data? Well, we measure heights, so it would be continuous data. How about audience ratings of a film on a scale of one to five, where five means excellent? Now, even though these numbers are well, even though the answers are numbers, they represent opinions. You know, it's kind of like I hated it to I loved it. So these are actually qualitative data because a two isn't twice as good as a one, right? A two doesn't mean the film was twice as good as a one. We just know it's better.
Okay, so let's look at the following 20 scores from a 100 point uh, exam. So now this would be uh, an instance where we would have to bin these numbers because there's too much of a spread, right? If you've got a 100 point exam, you could have um, scores anywhere from 0 to 100. Now in this case, you're going to um, only put bins you know, as low as scores exist. So you start, I mean, this technically should go to 100, 95 to 100, because you could have had 100, right? And then you go down to the lowest score, which in this case looks like maybe it was 72. So they stopped it at 70. And the reason why they did this is because you always want your bins to be equal size, because then otherwise <clears throat> it throws things off. And what I mean by it throws things off, it, make, it makes it seem like there were more scores in that category than others. And the only reason why there were more is because the bin was bigger, right? So 99 to 95, if you go 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, you can see that's five numbers. So I, I would have preferred to see 96 to 100 and then 95 to 91 and so on and so forth. But it makes sense that you want to start at 90, right? Because that's the cutoff for for a, so sometimes you tweak the rules a little bit because of the connotation of grades. But in any case, here are your frequencies, right? There's one score in this range, two in this, three, and so on and so forth. Here are the frequencies, right? Because out of 20, you just do 4 divided by 20 <clears throat> is 20%. 7 divided by 20, 35%, and so on and so forth. And then the cumulative frequency, right? So here's 1, and then 1 plus 2 is 3, add 3 more is 6, and then you can see the last one is 20. And then you can also do, uh, the last one would be cumulative relative frequency. So this would be 5%, then this would be 5 plus 10 is 15, then you would add the other 15, this would be 30%, then you add 15 more, right, 45, then you add the 35 more and you get 80, and then you add in the 20 and the last one would be 100%, and that's cumulative relative frequency. And those are all the things that you would ever see in a frequency table. Bar and pie charts. So a bar chart shows each category with a bar whose length or height right, represents its frequency, or you could do them for relative frequencies. And then pie charts are almost always used just for relative frequencies because the entire pie always equals 100%. So each slice, each wedge, right, is proportional to the overall size. So it gives you an idea of its relativeness, its percentage, right, its relative frequency. So here's a typical example of a bar chart where the height tells you, okay, there were four of these and then seven of these. And you can see this frequency, not, you know, percentages. But over here, they put relative frequency. So you can also take this across and go, okay, that was about 16%. And this one, take it across, it's about 28%, and so on and so forth. And then here is your pie chart showing that C had the largest percentage and B and so on and so forth. Now with pie charts, if you don't put these percentages in there, they're not so much misleading, they're just not very informative because most people would look at these and they could tell you that F was the smallest, but they would have no idea what percentage that was. And they would look at D and A and they could tell, well, D looks like it's probably smaller, but I'm not sure. And again, they wouldn't know the percentages. So a good statistician would always list these percentages so that you can get the whole picture. It's always important to title or caption your graph so the reader know, uh, you know what the data represents. You always want to make sure that you have vertical and horizontal scales for your uh, graph so they know, you know exactly what the measurements are. And then if you have to use different colors and things, you have to have a legend so, again, people know what's going on. And you can see that, right, here's our vertical scale, here's our vertical scale. Things are labeled, right, here's our label labels, right? So those are all the things we're talking about. A histogram is a bar graph for quantitative data that um, is either binned or is continuous so that the bars touch. There's no um, gaps in between them. And then that, thus the, the widths of the bars have a meaning because it either represents uh, the category or the width of your uh, uh, continuous data. A line chart shows the data value for each category as a dot and then the dots are connected with lines and then for each dot the horizontal position is the center of the bin it represents and the vertical position is the data value for the bin so basically if you had if you tried to do it for something like this you would just put a dot here in the center 
and then a center, and then the center, right? And then you would connect those dots. Bink, 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 and that would be your line chart. A time series graph is a line chart or histogram in which the horizontal axis represents time. And that's usually the only um, good time to use a, a line chart. So this would be your histogram. This would be the line chart that would be created from your histogram. And I don't know about you, but I think the histogram is just a, a better way. It's a more uh, visually pleasing and it, it just it's easier to read. So the only time I would ever do a line chart, and that's just my own personal advice is for a time series, right? So if uh, uh, amounts are changing over time, then a line chart tells you what's happening. It shows you trends, right? So it shows you like if things are going up or things are going down over time. So how about this where we've got a table that shows the ages and the time when they won the award of all Academy Award winning actresses through 2017. We can make a histogram and a line chart to display these data. So we have basically we put them in decades, right? So women who won the award in their 20s versus their 30s and so on and so forth. So the data are quantitative and they're organized in 10 year bins. So we know that we want to make a simple histogram with each bin, right? Being the, that 10 year span. So the first bin is 10 to 20 and it starts at zero. And if you want to do a line, uh, graph you're always supposed to start at zero and end at zero if you know if you have that kind of data that starts and ends at zero and then here they are at the top of each thing da, da, da. and again i just think the histogram is better than the line chart but a time series diagram makes a lot of sense this shows a time series graph of homicide rates in the united states by year so you can see that you know we had this huge spike in homicide rates from the early 60s up to the mid 70s then it dropped down a little bit then it came back up and then right then we had a good drop in the early 80s and then it steadily climbed back up to the 90s and then since then we've had this great decline all the way to the 2000s it's kind of leveled off and then it's declined a little bit right so it tells you a lot about what's happening right that that homicide rates are coming down so something is working and so that's the importance of a time series graph is it allows you to analyze things, right? It shows you how the homicide rates per 100,000 people have changed from 1960 until 2020. And then you can go and kind of look for reasons why, you know, why was there this spike? And then why was there this huge drop and things like that? So that's the importance of displaying data.